Can I see a show of hands of first Wallace managing direct reports today? All right, so I'm gonna say a third of the audience, give or take. Now, uh, in addition to folks who are managing, because the answer is yes uh, to this one too, but are, do you consider yourself a team leader, like in a team lead style role, or in some way influencing a team or, and or managing? So to help me out here, Okay, maybe just a few people more. Okay, so everybody else, you may be interested in becoming a manager, you may be driving towards becoming a manager, you may want to know if your manager is doing a good job or not, um, you know, something like that. So, so uh, as to whatever is, is, is inviting you or, 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 or why you chose this one of the other talks, then uh, uh, if I don't get to it or I don't answer it, please speak up. This is what we'll talk about uh, uh, very quickly because we're gonna get to each of these, but this is just my outline. The first few things, uh, um, there, and then from here, and then the next few things, and we'll finish up. I do have, I have not yet posted the slides, but I will, so if you're not a furious note taker, don't worry about it, uh, and I'll give you the link at the end. Uh, I'm also going to mention books, uh, the, the most prominent of which are these two. These are your are copies to give away, my own copies are back here, okay? So uh, uh, hopefully... Uh, uh, we'll find a way or a reason. I realize there's too many, I do not have a book for everybody, so maybe we can figure out a way to uh, negotiate who gets the books. Uh, uh, but I'll be mentioning a, a few more than just those two. I also have that list at the end of the slides as well. So also, if you're not a furious note taker there, or you don't have a fantastic memory, then uh, um, don't worry about it. So let's start with, uh, uh, with why. One of my favorite speakers uh, articulates the, the reasons for starting with why. Uh, in this uh, quote of his, if you've not seen, seen Simon Sinek present, he has a, a very, very popular, famous TED Talk. You can find it easily on YouTube. Uh, he's written a number of books, the most recent of which just came out, um, The Infinite Game. But uh, the reason that I'm doing this, there's a few reasons, but one, because there's a dearth of management and leadership training in information security specifically. There is some management training if you've looked around for it. Your company may have, may have, have management training, but very few security folks tend to get up and talk about what it means to be an effective leader, what it means to be an effective manager. Not, I mean, they're, they're more than just me. But, uh, uh, but that's, what, that's one thing that's important. Uh, you know, the other reason why it's important for me to get up here and talk about it is because I want you all to know how important it is in security to have folks like you leading. Folks who are interested in being a leader, folks who are moved by being a leader. So let me tell you um, a little bit about why I do what I do. Um, I'm thinking of three people in my head right now, none of them are in the room, so they won't have to be embarrassed. But uh, um, three people that have affected as a manager, and none of whom are working for me right now, but they have worked for me in the past. Uh, in previous roles. Um, one uh, is a very outgoing, extroverted, extroverted person, and he really needed uh, guidance in terms of how to be a, a leader and a manager. He wanted to grow, he wanted to progress in his career, he wanted to lead people, but felt very uncomfortable doing so, and felt very uh, uh, ill-equipped to do so. It turns out he wasn't, he was very uh, uh, ready for it, but really needed the encouragement and the inspiration to lead a team of people. Uh, another person that I have in my head, fantastic contributor, very, very smart and sharp person uh, uh, in terms of security practice, pra pra practicing, um, but lacked, let's say, some social graces or some of those soft skills, like folks tend to say, and needed some coaching and guidance in that sense and to grow into becoming a manager from being a contributor. And I really uh, think fondly when I think of that person in terms of how much he has grown as a leader. Uh, and I had some small part to play in that. And the final third person I think of when I think of, of what it means to, um, to lead people, what it means to be an effective manager, and what results I have, have seen in my own career, um, I was leaving a role to go to another one. And this person who is gruff, and sarcastic and cynical and paranoid like every good security practitioner, super great at what he does, probably just like every single one of you, 
um, on, on the next to last day, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe my last day in this role, uh, came up to me in my office and uh, uh, now, I'm not gonna to tell you who this person is because it, it, it may or may not be embarrassing to this person, but um, uh, he cried. Um, uh, it was very moving to me. It was very moving to me. And he cried because uh, of the effect I had had on him as a manager. And, and, and I'm sharing these things not to, not to uh, um, you know, tout or boast, but to share that this can be your experience as well. Hopefully some of you have experienced moving and powerful moments as a manager or as a leader. If you haven't yet, I, I hope that, you're, that your goal or your objective or one of the things you're trying to do is not just to get good results, not just to retain people on your team, not just to grow your fiefdom or your sphere of influence or your, uh, your empire, but to move people, to inspire people, to do something and to get something done. So that's why I'm here. I want more of you to feel that if you haven't yet. Um, and I hope that that's part of why you're here as well. Um, in terms of the second piece, are you ready? I, I have this up here to challenge you, to challenge me, that there really are no prerequisite, prerequisites to management. There are no, there's no degree, there's no certification. It does help to be trained, uh, I think, uh, but, but there's nothing that you need to, to go into a training or some experience you have to have had. Uh, there are managers who come right out of school and it can be effective managers. There are folks who've been contributors for decades and can transition into management. There's nothing that's preventing you from transitioning into management today. Uh, uh, and there's nothing I think that should be holding you back. Okay. Um, in terms of the re another reason why I have this here, uh, or I, why I'm doing this training and this presentation, because I also do a training about this kind of stuff, a, a, a full day training that I did a few days ago uh, for some folks. Uh, the reason why I have this here is because um, some folks feel very ill-equipped to jump into a management role because there's no training program available to them. Um, I mentioned at the outset some enterprises, some large companies have massive, very efficient and effective training programs for all of their managers that may or may not be a place, you, you may or may not have that available to you. I'll mention some resources that you can take advantage of, some paid, some free, okay? Uh, um, but. Uh, uh, it's okay if you don't have a corporate training program. It's okay if you haven't been trained as a manager to aspire to grow into a role like that. <laughs> uh, uh, this is another thing that I want to speak to briefly and then move right along. Uh, I'm not going to spend tons of time on it, but uh, uh, there, are, there are lots of folks that tend to challenge the idea of, I want to be a leader, not a manager. And I would challenge right back those folks. And if that's your mindset, that, that management is negative, leadership is positive, strike that from, from, from your vocabulary. Because both can be positive and both can be negative. As we have all experienced, I'm sure, you can be working for very poor and very ineffective leaders. You can be working for very poor and ineffective managers. And the, and the, and the, the opposite is absolutely true. So these are not equivalent. These are not the same thing. A manager is someone with direct reports who can hire and fire. Okay, has responsibility for performance management and, and assessment and things like that. There's some very specific things that go into the definition of a manager. But a leader is someone who has followers. That's all. Sir. So all right, some people, manager is a job title. Right. And with specific duties, how are you, you're saying you're not necessarily appealing to that. You're appealing to something. Yeah, not necessarily. I think in terms of the effective practices, which we're about to talk about, in, in terms of this kind of one-on-one introductory coverage, the practices are the, are the same. So the practices I'm about to, to, to describe work the same if you're a team leader. They work if you're a manager with that title. They work if you're a manager in name only, but not title or not even in responsibility. But they work, they work, they work. They're the same practices for everybody. So what is an effective manager? An effective manager is someone who gets results and someone who retains their people. So that comes from this book, the first of the recommendations by Mark Horseman, the effective manager in, on page four, I believe it is. Page four, the definition of an effective manager is one who gets results and keeps her people. I will explain that, but that's, that's what we mean by an effective manager, not just a manager. And then what do we mean by being effective? Well, um, being effective is doing the right things. So you may have heard efficiency and effectiveness. These are two words that have specific definitions. Efficiency is doing things right or doing things well, but effectiveness is doing the right things. 
So that's why this is about effectiveness. Because you can be efficient and be doing the wrong stuff. You can be building the wrong widget. Very efficient, very good at it, but building the wrong widget. Okay, so we want to make sure we're doing the right stuff, and that's what this is about. Okay, so speaking of, let's jump right into it. In terms of what those things are, I'm going to give you the 10 essential practices in just a second, and then there's a slide or two. Uh, but that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the presentation. Uh, um, I will be quoting a number of people, but most prominently, Peter Drucker during this presentation. If you've not heard of Peter Drucker, that's the other book here. Uh, Drucker wrote, like, I don't know, 60, 80 books, something like that in his lifetime. Uh, too many to count, way too many to recommend. But probably the most powerful, in my opinion, is this one right here, The Effective Executive. And it's just, the title is deceptive if you don't know what he's talking about. This book was written about 53 years ago, okay? Uh, so not yesterday. Uh, um, and an executive by Drucker's definition is, an, is essentially a knowledge worker. And if you're not familiar with the term, he coined the term knowledge worker about 60 some odd years ago. 60 years ago, way before computers, you all are knowledge workers by his definition. So you all, by his definition, are executives. All right, that's enough about that. Uh, uh, this management uh, uh, and 101 and the 10 essential practices, which are in another slide, are all coming from four critical behaviors that are talked about in this book, The Effective Manager, the four are covered in depth, and then five practices for effectiveness, which are all covered in depth here in Drucker's book. So, one translation of what I just said is, no original ideas in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it is 101, right? We're not, we're not 201, we're not 301. This is, this is the basic stuff for effectiveness as a manager, and again, it's just not out there for everybody. So I'm trying to make it a little bit more prominent for you. So 10 essential practices. Uh, let's list them out. We've already started with the first one. Start with why and what must be done. In, in other words, effectiveness, okay? So we'll get into number two, three, four, and five in a second. One-on-ones, talk about performance, do coaching, delegate work, set goals, and execute. Those are the first five. This will be the end two. Uh, uh, and then six, track time. Seven, communicate effectively. Decision making with business driven mindset. Strengths, focus on strengths. Be healthy. And then, of course, there's no such thing as a top 10 without bonus practices. So, journal and reflect and read, and we'll talk about that at the end. Those are uh, uh, somewhat obvious, but maybe not. Yeah. So much for that. So let's talk about practice number two. Uh, uh, all right, so who, uh, so everybody I'm assuming has a manager, maybe you don't because you work for yourself. Uh, um, but do you do, do you have weekly one-on-ones if you're a manager? Or do you participate in weekly one-on-ones? Okay, interesting. Great, so let me, let me dive a little bit deeper into what this is. Um, so one-on-ones is the practice, the essential, first essential practice of any effective manager. Um, what I want to emphasize, though, is not just the one-on-one -on -one piece, but the weekly and with every direct report. Um, the re part of the reason why we need to get to know people, what, part of the reason why we're getting to know our people up here, which is the first critical behavior of an effective manager, is to know who they are, what they're looking for, what they need to be doing, how they need to be growing, whether they're being, uh, whether they're challenged, whether the role is right for them, all that kind of stuff. The best way to figure that out is to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and regularly talk about them, okay? Uh, uh, and this concept is coming from uh, a book called First Break All the Rules by the Gallup Organization. It's published maybe 20, 25 years ago. Uh, based on their research into what it meant to be. So you've heard of employee engagement surveys? You heard of employee engagement survey? Yeah, a lot of heads nodding. So that came from the Gallup research 20, 25, 30 years ago, okay? The original employee engagement surveys. Everybody does it differently now, but the original stuff came from the Gallup research, Gallup organization and their research into what it meant to be, to be, to have engaged employees. And lo and behold, uh, uh, to have engaged employees, to have people stay, uh, uh, you need good management. You probably also heard the phrase, people don't leave companies, they need managers, 
That also basically comes from the Gallup research, which is to say the most prominent reason for someone moving from one organization to another is because they're not pleased with their management. May or may not be your experience, I get that, but that is the most prominent, most often, most frequently cited reason for people uh, switching jobs, okay? So uh, one of the ways we practice, or one of the ways we, we mitigate against that in effective management is to get to know the folks who are working for us and to realize that uh, the single kind of uh, uh, one of those critical rules that we learn in kindergarten or that people think that we learn is we treat everybody the same. And the way we're the way the reason for the, the title of that book and the reason for this phrase break all the rules is because that is the first rule you need to break as a manager. You do not absolutely do not treat everybody the same in the way that you may think of it. OK, and that what that means is. Each of you as, as a contributor, each of you as a direct report to a manager needs something different than your peer or than somebody else in your organization. Do you need to be uh, assessed uh, uh, and calibrated across your team? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not talking about performance management here. We're talking about how you treat people. We communicate with people uniquely because people are unique individuals, and we work with people uniquely because people are unique individuals. That's what we mean by this, okay? That's what we mean by breaking the rules. We mean uh, treat someone individually how they need to be treated so that they can be the best worker and the best team member and the best contributor that they can do. So uh, uh, as an effective manager, the first goal should be, what does this, what is this person bring to me? What does this person need that I need, have to have to tell me that I need to hear? So, uh, uh, and this is described in depth, okay, but I'll give you the overview. Oh, uh, the quick version, and that is, uh, let the direct go first. So the effective manager says, what do you have for me? What, 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 tech, what, things, what things do I need to hear? What things do, we, do you want to talk about? What do you want to start with? Some folks will come right in and start with project stuff. Here's, this, here's the update on the project I'm working on. Here's the most critical thing I need. Here's the roadblock I'm running into, status report kind of thing. Other folks will be like, hey, you know, uh, I had this cool experience over the weekend. Let me tell you about that. You know? Or, you know what, Another, a third person will come in and say, I'm really not getting along with Bob. I, we gotta figure out how like, Bob and I can work together more effectively. Or we gotta figure out how Bob can stop being a, you know, something, right? <laughs> um, so, so it really depends on the person. And the effective manager knows that a one-on-one -on -one is about the direct, not about the manager. Because uh, the final thing that, that you can say about that is, if your manager needs your time, it's probably not hard for your manager to get time to time. Right? They'll schedule some time and say, move that meeting that you're in, come out of that thing, it's urgent, I need you. It is not easy for each of us to get time with our manager. Right? If I have something that I have to meet with my manager about, it's, it's much, much harder for me to get that manager's time, my manager's time, than it is for them to get time with me. Does that make sense? Right? Okay, good, that's not it. Uh, uh, the reason why it's scheduled, the reason why it's weekly is because absolutely we miss it. Absolutely, uh, things have to get rescheduled and moved around. So we need to make sure we're prioritizing it. We need to make sure that the time is scheduled and the time is, is, uh, uh, is important. So um, even when I'm traveling, I keep my one-on-one. Even when, I, so I, I, I was even in, and, and I only thought, I only think about this because a, a direct report cited it as something exceptional, and I, don't, I didn't think that it was, but she did. Uh, uh, when I was in India, 12 hours away, I still held my one-on-ones, you know, right before bed or right after I woke up. Uh, um, so it's difficult to do it as a manager, but you need to stick with it. It's a very important practice. And then remember, you are there to listen first, okay? Ideally, the agenda looks like this, 10 minutes for the direct, 10 minutes for you, 10 minutes share. Maybe 15 minutes for the direct, 15 minutes for you. Maybe some days, 29 minutes for the direct and one minute for you, okay? 30 minutes, usually. Okay, for a weekly one-on-one. -on -one. When it's weekly, you don't need much more than 30 minutes. Let's see if this works. All right, good. Moving on. So let's talk about the, the third uh, essential practice survey. Yep. Who, who in, in your uh, experience, who owns the calendar invite? And which one the manager. The manager owns the calendar invite. It's a, it's a good one uh, to clarify. Manager owns the calendar invite because the manager most often will have the conflicts. Right? So uh, very often, right, the, the, the proposed new time thing, I'll get that stuff from my directs, absolutely. But more often, I'm the one moving the calendar. Much easier to do it when the manager has that schedule. What are, what are your thoughts on scalability? 
I mean, <clears throat> you had ten or more direct reports. Right. You're talking right. about a significant amount of time. Just absolutely, like, absolutely. So, you, so, you, you so suggest adding a layer of management between your teammates, that sort of thing. Good. So, two answers to that question. First, uh, anything for me. So, your mileage may vary, right? For me, anything more than eight directs, really, really tough. Really, really tough to manage. It's possible uh, to do ten. 15 even, it's possible. Uh, but in that, uh, speaking about scalability, in that kind of range, even at eight and beyond, you may have to go uh, to every other week, right? And split things out. You, may, you still want to keep the, the minimum 30 minutes. You definitely don't want to go to 15 minute one-on-ones, totally ineffective. And you can't really go up to one hour very often with many people in that kind of situation. But every other week is not, is not a bad idea. The second answer to that question though is one-on-ones are your most powerful tool as a manager. That's why it's practice number two, okay? It's your most powerful tool. If you're consistently doing weekly one-on-ones with even 10 people, with even 10 directs, guess what? That's where you're getting all your escalations and your important stuff from each one of those people. They know they have the time, so they don't come to you randomly. They don't say, hey, Bob, hey, Jill, I, need, I really need you to take care of this thing, when they know in eight hours, in 12 hours, in 24 hours, in three days, I have a one-on-one. -on -one. Let me just wait till that time. So that becomes a very effective tool for managing that, that person individually. Either staff meeting or direct or, or your or your one-on-ones is where you get the vast majority of your action items or the things that you need to knock down to roadblock it, roadblock and dive down as a manager. Good? Cool? All right. Um, so the second uh, uh, critical behavior as a manager, we need, to, we need to talk about and work on performance. So this is frequent feedback, positive and negative. We're talking about behavior and not intent. So when you use the word uh, uh, us, when you use the words us and them, you communicate uh, siloed and, and, uh, um, and, in, and, and inappropriate kinds of, of attitudes. So very specific behavior, right? When you're typing in an email and you say, well, I really can't work with them. That's the thing, that's the behavior that, that you're talking about performance on. When uh, um, you're in a meeting and you're taking notes on a laptop, I need you to not do that because it really communicates to me and it communicates to our team members that you're not engaged. If we're convinced that you're doing email, even if you're taking notes on your, on your laptop, et cetera, et cetera. These are behaviors. Behaviors is what we give performance on, performance feedback on. We don't get performance feedback on intent. I have no idea what you guys are thinking. Your manager doesn't know either. You don't know what your directs are thinking. You have an idea. Maybe even they tell you that, 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 what, what they're thinking. What you communicate on in terms of performance is behavior, not intent. Because behavior is modifiable, behavior is changeable. You can't convince somebody to change their heart or change their mind. Sorry, okay? We talk about what's going on today so that we can encourage the right behavior in the future. So when I give you positive feedback on Scott, do more of this thing because this is what makes my job easier. That's what we want to do. Or uh, uh, Alice, please stop doing that because that makes my job hard. Okay. Now for reference and again scalability and and uh, and just uh, um, frequency here, just so you have an idea, I try to give at least one piece of feedback to every direct report every week. Okay. If more frequent, fantastic. <laughs> two or three pieces of feedback every week, that's awesome, wonderful. But one or two things on feedback every quarter, not good, that's not what we're looking for. Frequent, positive and negative, often. Yes? How do you try to balance positive versus negative feedback so that I mean, there needs to be some balance, right? I love that question because it's a weakness of mine. I don't know if you asked me on purpose, but if so, the check's in the mail. Uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I have a tendency, if you don't know me personality-wise, I'm a very optimistic, outgoing person, so I tend to give positive feedback all the time. So I use an app to track what kind, how many pieces of feedback I give to each direct report. No, 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 no. Got it, right, got, got it in my pocket, I'll show you after, if you're curious. Uh, um, but it shows me, it, it encourages me to do feedback every week, or every, every day, and I don't get to it every day, but I get to it every week. And I track, okay, for direct report one, two pieces of positive feedback, uh, for direct report two, two pieces of negative, et cetera, et cetera. So that just keeps, keeps me aware of what I'm doing. And I don't always use it as a, I use it as a guideline, right, versus a rule, but yeah. Yep? Yeah, just one that, uh, regarding the frequent feedback. Yep. It's also important that it is close to the coachable moment. Great, thank you. And again, again, if I, I've said it a lot already, but I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna emphasize, 
All of these behaviors described in depth in here, and that is also part of it, which is you want it to be close to the thing, right? So if the email was written a few or, you know, earlier today, great time to give feedback. The, feed, the email was written or the behavior was practiced in a meeting three weeks ago, not a good time for feedback, okay? Find something else. If they're doing it frequently, guess what? You're gonna have lots of opportunity. Okay? <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. You missed it, no big deal, no big deal. You can't wait for a one-on-ones. One-on-ones is a great time for feedback for me, I find, because I got them, focus time, all my, well, two of my three direct reports are not in Austin, so video is, is helpful. I do feedback over the phone on a regular basis, but I prefer face-to-face -face via video, so sometimes I wait for one-on-ones. All right. Uh, in terms of, of some of the other activities that we're doing, uh, um, let's focus on number four, coaching and delegation. I'm going to breeze over these because these are very deep topics and we don't have enough time to cover them. So I want to make sure you know what the behaviors are. And again, these are the final two critical management behaviors that are covered in this book, The Effective Manager. Four critical behaviors for an effective manager are know your people, uh, communicate about performance, ask for more and uh, push work down, both of which are the next two here. So we do coaching and delegation. For coaching now, in terms of asking for more, when we coach our team members, we collaborate on what we're gonna do. So we're working together, you and I, to try and figure out what is our goal. And then we're working together, you and I, on what is the plan to get to that goal. And then we're working together, you and I, on what's just, how, how are you doing on that plan? Possibly, usually weekly in the one-on-one, -on -one, okay? What progress have you made? It's absolutely weekly though. It's not monthly, it's not quarterly. This is a skill that we want to develop and grow in you, and so we're working on it all the time, every week, okay? We agree on what we want to do, and then I want to see progress from you, hopefully weekly, but definitely every other or every third week. We want to see something. So we, the action needs to be something you can do in a day or two, because you've got a week to do it, right? And you've got plenty of other stuff on your plate. That's coaching. Man, I'm just not going to depend on this thing anymore. Uh, um, in terms of delegation, okay, uh, um, delegation is a powerful tool as a manager. This is probably one that's like Captain Obvious, but let me tell you why it's powerful. You get more time back as a manager. If you've been managing, you know you just don't have enough time in the world to do everything that's, that's being asked of you. Uh, probably as a contributor, that's probably your status right now too. You would love to be able to delegate things. And great, you probably can. Uh, um, so you free up some time. Delegation is a powerful tool for empowering your team, communicating to them that you depend on them, that, that you want them to be effective contributors, and you want them to be doing, doing their job by giving them more responsibility, right? And then the final thing that's great about delegation is that is how you develop the person that's going to take your job. So that you can take the next one, okay? Probably everybody in this room, especially if you're coming to a talk about management, you wanna grow in your career. I'll make that assumption, okay? Um, if you wanna grow in your career, one of the things that holds you back often is somebody is not available to take the thing that you're doing today. Well, that's how you fix it. Push work down, okay? All right, again, talked about it in depth. So now we're gonna move on to a few other things that are covered by, uh, by, by either a different book or some different stuff. So uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about execution because we can't talk about getting results without describing what that means and how to get from here to there. So uh, um, who participates in annual goal setting for their team or company? Great, who has a personal set of goals, either quarterly goals or annual goals? Written, written down. Awesome, love to hear it. Okay, so two, one, one book, if you are looking for personal goal setting guidance, is Your Best Year Ever, and I realize now I don't think I have that on my book list. Your Best Year Ever by Michael Hyatt, if you're looking for a, a, a framework for setting personal goals, that is a system or a framework. Um, if you're looking for how to do goal setting and execution on those goals with your team or within a division or within your company, uh, best recommendation I've ever found and, and, and working with right now, working with this system, the four disciplines of execution. It's, a, it's abbreviated 4DX. Uh, it's by the Franklin Covey folks, published it uh, uh, many years ago, and it's based off some of their research and their coaching and guidance with organizations. 
the four disciplines of execution is a framework, and it's actually listed here. These things are the four disciplines of execution that are described in the book of the same name, and uh, uh, the guidance from, again, the Franklin Covey folks. The idea here is you, uh, um, you identify something that you want to work on, uh, the wildly important goal or the essential initiative, or uh, uh, their terminology is WIG, wildly important goal. Um, you build a way for tracking it. The reason for a scoreboard, if you uh, uh, can imagine being in a stadium during a football game or being in the stadium at the World Series, uh, if you're an Astros fan, uh, then uh, um, imagine watching the game with no scoreboard. How fun or compelling is that? Not at all. You have no idea what the heck is going on, right? Especially in a football game. All sorts of people doing stuff, this or that. What down is it? What's the score? I have no idea. When the scoreboard is there, everybody is focused on what's going on. The coach, the team, the quarterback, or the pitcher, or the catcher, or whatever the sport you're talking about is. And the audience, and the announcers. Everybody is laser focused on the scoreboard. That's why they emphasize and talk about a scoreboard concept. Want to know more? Read the book. Uh, lofty goals and specific actions. The idea here is strategic plans and goals are all great, but what are we doing this week? What are we doing next week? What are we doing this month? What are we doing this quarter? So that's the concept there, not, not rocket science. Yep? Yeah, good question. How do you uh, encourage, uh, <laughs> encourage my manager to uh, move from the strategic to more? <laughs> How we don't is the, is the short answer. You probably don't. Uh, um, there are ways to, and there are plenty of books written. Yeah. I've read some of them. There are plenty of books written about that concept. Dangerous concept, the concept of, not this is, this is what you were saying, but the concept that people talk about managing your boss or managing up, very dangerous activity. Do it very carefully, okay, if you do it at all. Uh, uh, it could be a career limiting move, right? Uh, resume generating event, something like that. So, so, uh, uh, so, so be careful. Um, so if you have somebody receptive to this kind of thing, then you might introduce something that's not your recommendation, right? You might introduce, you may, hey, I went to this fantastic presentation at last time. This guy, this wacko presenter, recommended uh, this book called The Four Disciplines of, Disciplines of Execution by the Covey folks. Maybe we should look at it. You know, that, that's a way. But beyond that, not sure I would go much further than that unless you have a great, awesome relationship with your boss. Hopefully you do. In which case, have a conversation. Go to, get, have some coffee, go to lunch. Thanks, sir. Yeah, sure. The last part of this, in terms of execution, is making sure we're all accountable, right? Making sure we're tracking to our goals and making sure we execute on what we're supposed to do. Supposed to do. None of this is rocket science, but the hard part is what they, the terminology they use in the book is whirlwind. So if, does that describe your day-to-day? -day? It describes my day-to-day. -day. The whirlwind, that's their term for the day-to-day. -day. That's why we don't get stuff done. That's why we don't get stuff done. Because we all have that whirlwind day-to-day. So uh, if you want a system or a framework for doing it with a team, uh, the four disciplines of execution. All right, let's keep going because I need to, to, to be careful of my time here. Uh, um, speaking of time. Um, so we already said it, or I, I already uh, talked about it in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, but one very powerful technique, now I'm switching to this book, okay, The Effective Executive by Drucker. Uh, um, one powerful technique that Drucker describes in, uh, in there, it's actually the first of his five practices for effectiveness, is knowing time and his description. So this is a guy, if, sorry, if you're not familiar, this is a guy who worked with very, very famous CEOs and executives in huge companies and small companies for like, I don't know, uh, 60 or 70 years or something, okay? Uh, a management consultant. Um, widely considered the guru or, or the, 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 the best and most powerful thinker about management in the last 50 years. Uh, um, so this guy was sitting down with CEOs all the time, uh, and his very common experience, which he describes in the book, is that CEOs and any other leader have a very uh, uh, incorrect assumption or do not really know how they spend their time. They're convinced they're spending their time in sales meetings or meeting with clients or executives or trying to uh, uh, try and understand their customers. And when in fact they actually measure their time or more likely their assistant me me measures their time and tracks what they're doing, they're spending time on email, they're spending time in meetings with, within internal groups, they're spending time on things that do not at all match up with what they do. Now, these are the folks who are the highest paid in the organization, right? They need to be spending every minute effectively. 
but it would be very incorrect for each of us to consider ourselves any less important in some sense. I realize none of us are as high paid probably as our top, as our top person in our organization. However, every one of us as an, as an executive, as a knowledge worker, as an important contributor who has impact on the organization when we make a decision, we need to be careful to make sure that we're spending our time effectively. So if you don't know how you spend your time on a weekly and monthly basis, you should measure it. There are tools to do this. I use one called Timing on my Mac. Uh, there's another one called Office Time that I've seen people use in, in Windows, which is very effective. Rescue Time is one, too, that I've seen people use. Uh, you can use a tool. You can use the old, good old classic notepad, right? What did I do in the last 30 minutes? What did I do in the last 15? What did I do in the last few hours? Okay, if you're not tracking your time, I guarantee you, you have the wrong idea of where you're spending it. I'm not saying I spend my time effectively or perfectly every week. I definitely do not. I have a lot more time tracked in email than I care to admit. Okay, it's like this versus what I really want to be doing. Okay, um, but I know that about me. And my question to you is, do you know that about you? Do you know where you're spending your time? Uh, Parkinson's Law, if you're not familiar with it, anybody can quote it for me, Parkinson's Law? Now, work expands to the time allotted. Right? So, some nodding heads because you know and you felt it that if you have two hours to complete something, guess what? It's going to take two hours. If you have five days to complete something, guess what? It's going to take five days. If you have five minutes, it's going to take five minutes. That's just how it works. Right? I had a certain number of days and hours to complete this presentation, and I barely got it in. Scott can attest. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, uh, you have to know where you're spending time and how you're spending time. And then, and then the, one of the ways or one of the things to, to make sure that you're doing what, uh, um, what, what you want to be doing is then keeping an eye on that time, on that time uh, um, report and, 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 keeping, and, and then understanding whether that time spent is how you want it to be. So the reason I put this up, is that, that, that third one is to remind me of a book called Essentialism by Greg McEwen to recommend. Uh, uh, and I learned, one of the things I learned in that book, we, and the title is, is perhaps obvious, but I will explain, uh, his whole argument in that book is about how you should be focused on the most important thing to do right now and try to get rid of everything else, which is a relatively impossible task in security, I think, but probably in everything else. Uh, uh, but one thing I learned in that book, besides the obvious, is that the, uh, uh, the etymology of the word priority. So the word priority, until about 30 or 40 years ago, was a singular word. There was no such thing as priorities before 1950 or so, okay? There was a priority. We have a priority, and that's it. And we, you know, I would, I would argue, and I think Greg McEwen, not, not I think, Greg McEwen argues, for sure we need to get back to that definition, that priority is singular. Um, speaking of, uh, there, is, there are some people who are successful, and then there are Warren Buffett, uh, um, but, uh, uh, <laughs> But yeah, um, he says no to almost everything, just like we should. So in communication, uh, um, we, we're talking about relationship building. Um, I'm going to leave you with something because, again, there's not enough time to talk about it really uh, um, and do it justice. So this is more of a, again, a pointer to resources that, uh, that, that I would encourage you to, to explore. Um, but communication is much, much more about listening than it is about talking. Okay, or observing perhaps, observing and listening than it is about talking. Um, uh, Drucker said it this way. And the author of this book here, Mark Horstman, said it this way. I'll go back to uh, explain what I mean by those quotes and, and by what we're talking about here. Uh, communication is much more about knowing your audience and knowing about how to listen to the person. It could be an audience of one, right, in a one-on-one. -on -one. It could be an audience of 60, 70, something, I don't know. Uh, um, so maybe I'm a bad counter, maybe it's 50. Am I, am I, am I infl artificially inflating the, uh, uh, the audience? Um, so uh, it's much more about who you're talking to. So one, it, one uh, tool, if you're not familiar with it, so you've probably heard about personality types, right? People know their personality type, their Myers-Briggs personality type. I'm an ENFP. Um, but one thing that, that, that many fewer people are familiar with that I would encourage you to explore is a behavioral instrument called DISC, D-I-S-C. 
Again, there's not enough time for me to explain it in depth, but as a broad brush overview, the concept is we all have behaviors, default behaviors, and chosen behaviors. And the default behavior might be uh, really assertive and task-focused. Wow. Uh, um, nice. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we might have an assertive or task-focused behavior. Default, we might have an assertive or uh, people-focused uh, uh, default behavior. We might have a reserved and people-focused default behavior or a reserved and task-focused default behavior. There are four quadrants in four, like D-I-S-C, uh, assertive task, reserved task-focused, people and assertive, people and task-focused. The reason why this is helpful is because when you understand somebody's default behavior, you can communicate with them more effectively. You can choose, as the speaker, as the listener, and as the participant, you can choose to, be, to, to behave more like they behave by, by default. So this was a revelation to me in communication. I, if you have not gathered it already, I'm a very assertive and people-focused person, outgoing. If you get emails from me, I have lots of exclamation marks and emoticons in my emails, okay? Uh, um, when I talk to you, I'm first I first care most about what's going on with you, how was your weekend, okay? Those kinds of things. Uh, Task-focused people, when they first encounter you, they're much more interested in the kind of transactional piece. It's not that they don't care about you as a person, but the first thing that they're leading with is, what, what are we, how are we doing on that project? What's going on here, okay? Um, in technology, which is the vast majority of us here, uh, um, if, if you're not familiar with your, with your disk behavioral style and technology, you're a vast majority, uh, uh, probably a C, which is conscientious, and that means you're reserved most often, and that means that you are task-focused, and it means uh, people like me are, are uh, struggle working with you because, because you write emails that are 50 miles long, you know? <laughs> and I, you lost me in the first sentence. I was waiting for like your bottom line up front, uh, uh, and, and your bottom line is like, bottom in the line. bottom line. <laughs> you know? uh, um, so I, I have learned how to work better with folks like that, and folks like that who are starting to observe better and listen, learn how to work better with me, and we all communicate more effectively. So uh, this, is, this is a concept that it really needs a lot more treatment, so this is, this is something that if it's interesting to you, I don't have a book, to cover it, I have a training course to recommend to you, and uh, uh, it's from a group called Manager Tools, and they have a, a training, a one-day training course called the Effective Communications Conference. It's for contributors and for managers, okay? And they do it here in Austin at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. One-day training. All right, so these are ready. Very good. Uh, um, so uh, uh, decision-making is a critical skill for everyone, in particular executives and knowledge workers like us. Uh, um, the, uh, there is a way to do it well, uh, uh, and for InfoSec people in particular, part of the way of doing it well is to make sure that you do it with the business in mind, because this is why your business exists. Whoever you work for, whatever you do, you're in nonprofit, you're in manufacturing, you're in retail, you're in finance, you're in high technology, I don't care. Your business exists to do this. And if you are not contributing to this, if you are not keeping in mind this with every single decision that you support, then you're doing it wrong. Absolutely doing it wrong. This is why you exist, this is why I exist, this is why we're paid, this is how we make money, okay? This right here. You've got to keep this in mind if you want to make effective decisions first. It has to begin with business driven. It has to begin with customer. What question with your yeah. that? Because to me, I exist to prevent a data breach, yep. which is keeping the customer. Absolutely. 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 And keeping that in mind, you're able to support a decision with that in mind. But primarily, if we're not delivering something to a customer, right, we can't, so, so there's absolutely, Bailey, there, there's, Bailey and I work for the same organization. Uh, um, we absolutely have to keep this in mind, of course, that we're, we're part of the risk management piece of the business. We, we're part of the keeping the customer, not necessarily going to get the customer, okay? Um, but if we don't keep in mind that the product folks we're working with, that we're trying to enable and support, 
that the, the sales folks were trying to enable and support, the marketing folks, the legal folks, okay, even the HR and finance folks, that everybody's driving towards creating a customer, um, we, have to, we, we at least have to keep that in mind. Sir? I was even along that, if you're not keeping your customers, you all the sales people are gonna have a hard time creating new ones. Absolutely, so. absolutely, great, great, absolutely. So yeah, if we think of ourselves as creating customers, I think that's also an excellent way of observing the role of, of information security. Um, a, a few other things, the elements of an effective decision are the fifth practice that's described here in the effective executive, so dive in deep if that's interesting to you. It's a very high level description in Drucker's text, so it's not appropriate for, for this right now. Uh, um, uh, you have to have a lot of people in the room to make the right decision because you have to know that you have a diversity of opinion. Um, and you need to make sure the decisions are revisited. Uh, particularly in information security, I think that we, we, that we suck at this in the sense that we make, we make recommendations and we support decisions all the time, and we rarely go back and see, wait a minute, was that the right thing to have recommended at the time? Because did it really make that big of a deal uh, that, there was this, that this was remediated in, in a certain amount of time, or that we focused on driving back the, uh, the deliverable for, for, uh, for this technical debt uh, thing to eliminate or something like that? I don't know. Maybe the answer is absolutely yes, we did the right thing. But you should revisit those decisions as best as you possibly can. That's one way of measuring whether you make effective decisions. Strengths-based leadership is number nine, uh, making sure that strengths is what you're focusing on. Uh, so this is also described in depth by the Gallup organization. This is also what came out of their research 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and the concept here is quite simple. We all have strengths, we all have weaknesses. Uh, compensate for weaknesses by bringing people on your team who have strengths that are not yours. That's the, that, is, that is it right there, okay? Make sure that you know what your strengths are, make sure that you know where you're weak, and bring people into your team. Encourage folks who have strengths that are not yours so that you have that diversity of, uh, of skills. Diversity of talent is, I guess, the way I wrote it down. Uh, uh, I would be remiss, I've really observed, I think in a very positive way, there's a wonderful trend uh, uh, in the information security community to actively talk about the fact that we have health issues within security. And sure, I mean, we have, we have physical health issues all across the world. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm talking more about most mental and emotional health issues. And so I wanted to keep this as a top level issue for us as managers and leaders in information security to be aware. Uh, um, for me, this plays out most likely or most rather most actively or most frequently in my kind of daily and weekly practices. Uh, whether you call them rituals or not like I do, it's up to you, but I have a morning kind of ritual I go through, an evening ritual I go through, and part of that is bookending my day so that I'm not doing work all the freaking time. Because it certainly could, it's there, right? I'm sure it's there for you too. We can always be doing work, but it's very unhealthy. And, and uh, um, we need to be careful as managers and leaders that we're not just worried about our own health, but we're concerned about our team's health as well. As, as much as possible, I've realized that we can be too intrusive. Um, but modeling that for your team, modeling healthy practices as a manager or leader, and then encouraging healthy practices with your team is something that, that you should be careful of. Uh, and remember, uh, I don't know that work-life balance is really the way to say it. There, there are issues with that, with that phrase. Um, uh, but whatever it is for you, please make sure you know what that is and you're practicing on a regular basis, whatever that balance looks like. It may be 90-10, it may be 50-50, uh, I don't know. That's up to you, but you gotta find something that works and you gotta stick to it and balance it. Okay, uh, uh, I'm gonna try to wrap it up because I know I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm way past here in terms of where I wanted to be. Um, if you don't have a mentor or someone who can help you on this journey of being a manager, I have three mentors I work with regularly, one I've been working with for almost 10 years now. Uh, um, I also mentor people, which is another way to grow as a leader yourself. If you're not a manager today, and there are people that you can mentor, you know, folks who, who you can show the ropes, please be doing that, that helps you grow as a leader. Uh, if you don't have a written career plan, if you don't have an idea where you wanna be, uh, please, please work on that as well, and this is part of it. And then uh, practicing these essential practices, I suppose is the most obvious statement in the world, but that's how we get better at doing this stuff. Uh, I'm gonna just list these up here, the 10 essential practices one more time. We talked about it all. At the very end, I had journal and reflect. 
It, this goes into the health piece of it. Uh, I journal. Uh, I try to journal every day. Uh, and I don't always get to it. And then in terms of going forward and being a better person, uh, I read. These are the books that I recommended. Uh, I tried to recommend or mention. I did not mention them all. Uh, this is a productivity book, if you're not familiar with it. This is a different kind of productivity book by Cal Newport. Uh, this is a decision-making book, which is excellent. Uh, this one also is a decision-making book. I mentioned strengths-based leadership in the strengths section. I didn't call it out as a book. And this is a kind of a, a, a random recommendation for you if you're looking for something to uh, guide your life and you're not a religious person uh, or something else. Or the meditations. What's that? Or the meditations. Oh, uh, sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. Marcus Aurelius is where uh, is a uh, uh, Roman emperor uh, and widely uh, uh, credited as a Stoic philosopher. Amongst other Stoic philosophers. Okay, folks. Sorry I pushed this up at the end. I was trying to be better on time, but thank you very much.